Well, Sarah, do you confess? And what do you have to say, soldier? I'm going to kill you, Hopkins. I don't think you'll find that easy. The law is with me, remember. Witchfinder General was Price's 75th role, and it's probably one of the most interesting films in his entire filmography. Um, it was actually made by a small British company called Tigan Pictures, which is short for Tiger and Lion. It's a creature with aspects of both. And they made very low-budget horror films uh, in England. I think they were trying to become another Hammer film company. After The Sorcerer was made and was a reasonable success for Tony Tenser and Tygon Productions, they were looking around for something else to, to make. And they would found this book uh, by Ronald Bassett, uh, which was basically an historical novel, not even a horror novel, uh, about a real-life witch finder, Matthew Hopkins, who existed during Cromwell's times, who was a bit of a, a bit of a, a wide boy, as it were, and would go around the country and, and, and would get money for nefarious purposes, while at the same time supposedly uh, finding witches and, and, and getting them to confess. An evil man. A papist. You're burning candles and all. That is no proof of witchcraft in itself. Dressed himself in devil's garments, he did. And made unholy signs. He did, I saw him. I will find out the truth for you. Have no fear, friend. And this is how he made his living. He would go around the country with his assistant, and he would uh, find a village where there might be somebody who was suspected of being a witch, and he would do the horrible tests and make sure they were burned or hanged or whatever and then he'd take his money and move on to the next village and he convinced so many people that this work was legitimate that he was actually called witch finder general by the way do you know what they call me now well witch finder general there are those who think that i should be appointed such for all of england appointed by parliament now the thing is the historical uh matthew hopkins uh died of old age in his bed, which is really one of nature's great injustices. But the, the send-off that Vincent Price's Matthew Hopkins gets in Witchfinder General is far more satisfying. I mean, we're talking revenge plus a hundred. It's, it's a wonderful ending for a terrible, terrible character. <laughs> And it seemed, I guess, like a, a, a good project to get off the ground uh, because it had, he had some scope, it had some, it had some, uh, some style, uh, unlike a lot of, of, the, of the British horror films being made at that time. Also, I think Cromwell uh, had just come out or was about to come out. And again, it could be that there was some sense that there was something in the air and they wanted, you know, an, a nice big movie. Unfortunately, I don't think Michael Reeves was actually given the budget or the time he really deserved to make the film that the, uh, the original script lays out. One of the things about Michael Reeves is he may well have been among the first people ever to go to school and think, I want to be a film director when I grow up. Previously, people had got into movies through sort of apprenticeships or, yeah, in the early days of Hollywood, after having been, you know, flyers or explorers or glove salesmen or whatever, and they ended up as, as filmmakers or they came out of the theatre. Michael Reeves, almost from infancy, wanted to direct films. Um, yeah, he may well have been among the first generation who knew what a director even was as a kid. Uh, and so, you know, he focused so strongly on that. Um, uh, you know, he directed, you know, when he was a kid, he directed uh, films at school. Uh, he, you know, I think when he, he entered the film industry, basically as a gopher on, on uh, various big productions in, in Europe, he still was focused intently on directing. He directed his first film at a very young age. Yeah, you know, uh, if, if we're taking the She-Beast as a, a you know, as a, a debut after you know the uh, the assistant direction on, on um, Castle of the Walking Dead. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean this is a basically a twenty year old kid. I mean even these days he would be considered young to make a film, um, freakishly young. You know, Harmony Corrine young. Um, and back then when young was it? I mean it may well have been that 
he got some breaks he wouldn't have got if he'd been 30 when he was making films. Then, yeah, he would have been almost like a, yeah, a bumptious young man who was a bit irritating and had a public school privileged background. But by being 20, I think, yeah, basically just the mere fact of him was so astonishing that doors opened. Uh, of course, that doesn't last very long. Uh, yeah, talk to Orson Welles. Michael Reeves is, is an odd character in British movie history. Uh, he was born in 1943 in Surrey, grew up as a public school boy, and yet somehow by the mid-60s seemed to have got into movie making in Italy or Yugoslavia, being a, an assistant director on, on, a, on at least a couple of, of, of weird co European co-production movies. Uh, the most interesting, I guess, is that... Uh, we think of, of Michael Reeves having made three movies. I, can, I tend to think of him making three and a half movies uh, because one of the films he worked on was uh, Castle of the Living Dead with Christopher Lee as uh, a mad scientist who can petrify people with a, with a weird serum. And although Michael Reeves supposedly was the assistant director on that movie um, uh, for the director who's credited on the print as Herm Herbert Wise, but in fact is Luciano Ricci, uh, there was apparently some kind of falling out between uh, the director and the producers. And so for the last couple of weeks, Michael Reeves took over the directing of the film and for what we know, probably produced some of the more interesting material in that film. I think the interesting thing is that after Castle of the Living Dead and he also worked on Genghis Khan for Henry Levin, uh, Jack Cardiff's The Long Ships, in, in various production capacities, he somehow managed to get a very small amount of money together to produce uh, his own horror movie, which is a, a film called The She-Beast, or in this country called uh, The Revenge of the Blood Beast. And it was reputedly made for something like £15,000, which is about $30,000, which is a very low amount of money even in those days. Um, it's not a very good film. It, it didn't get a very wide release at the time. And you look at it now, and it looks almost like a home movie. The only interesting thing about it is that it's the first time that uh, Michael Reeves and his, his schoolboy friend Ian Ogilvie get to work together. And back when they were children, they used to make little 16 millimeter movies together and, and whatever. And obviously, um, he always thought of Ogilvy as his muse and, and tended to put him into everything else he did in his filmmaking career. Uh, the She-Beast is, is one of those very simple movies about a, a witch's curse and reincarnation. It was shot in, in Yugoslavia with a, a multinational crew. Uh, apparently, the film could only afford Barbara Steele for one day, and uh, stories, apocryphal stories vary between 12 or 18 hours, and she apparently got paid £1,000 to come in, do her role in one day, and then leave. Uh, God knows what she thinks of the film because, as I say, the finished version is is nothing to shout about. And so it's it's all the more remarkable that from that film, the following year, Reeves went on to work on on pretty much the first of of his two great movies, which is The Sorcerers. He got a reasonable amount of money from Tygon, Tony Tenser, and uh, and created what is basically one of the most downbeat horror films of the 1960s. The great thing about The Sorcerers was it was kind of set in the seedy underbelly of, of London and, and very different from the kind of London that the movies were depicting in the 1960s. And uh, it's a bit of a stretch for Karloff as well, who plays this, uh, who really does play an older gentleman by this time, who's invented this uh, brain-switching machine where he can put his thoughts into other people's brains. And it's his wife, played by Catherine Lacey, who abuses this power and basically has these vicarious thrills through Ian Ogilvy's character. Uh, but it's certainly, from the She-Beast, it's a great step up for Michael Reeves, and suddenly you, you see this talent was there. It's not one of the great films of all time, and I think it is overrated to a certain extent, but it's certainly a very interesting British horror film, and it's very different to anything that Amicus or Hammer were doing at the same time. I think certainly the technical differences between the She-Beast and Witchfinder General are to do with everybody else catching up with what Reeves wanted. I think he knew what he wanted going in, uh, and I think he was able to get stronger collaborators around him. I think, like all great auteurs, you know, you take all the credit, but you really need everybody else. Uh, I think he was he was learning to work with writers, for instance. Uh, he he doesn't really have script credits on, on his films. He used the name Michael Byron as, as a writer. Um, but I think he, he was starting to realise that there were parts of the, the process of making films he needed other people for. He was starting to look at books as subject matter, for instance. And I think that that's a you know, obvious sense that he realised there were things that weren't in his personality that, that real films needed. 
uh, and certainly, you know, working with John Cockey Long, working with the Paul Ferris, the, the, the composer on, on Wishfinder General, and, and just, you know, that array of British character actors, all the way down to Wilfred Bramble in not only one scene, but one shot, uh, you know, shows that he could handle that. I mean, he was obviously getting ready to work on bigger things, bigger productions, whether they would have let him. Yeah, uh, because, let's like say, as, as Orson Welles found, being you know, a slightly older boy wonder, you didn't get the breaks you got the first time out. And also, I think, you know, the knives would have come out as well. And certainly, you can't be that young and that clever and, and, and that privileged without really annoying a lot of powerful people. But having said that, you, you look at Witchfinder General now, and, it, and it's another major step up in his career. And there's no doubt that if he had lived, um, he would be a major director uh, nowadays. And uh, it, it's a great lost opportunity that uh, he never survived beyond the 1960s. He was known as being a troubled man, Michael Reeves was. He had, he had many different problems. And uh, he was a very fine director, though. In fact, he was signed to do... Price's next film after that called The Oblong Box and he apparently had had even started some of the work on it and he died suddenly and uh, we'll never know what his legacy might have been but he did leave behind this one this one great film. I think one of the great tragedies of, of life is that uh, Michael Reeves after which Finder General apparently could not get any more work, although he was attached to the Oblong Box, which was going to be the next Vincent Price, Christopher Lee movie for AIP, and apparently did do some preliminary work on it. Um, by all accounts, he became depressed, he drank heavily, he was always into drugs anyway to a certain extent, as most young people were in the 1960s. And he died of uh, barbiturate poisoning. Then your confessions of witchcraft are proven beyond a doubt in the sight of God and you will be withdrawn from the water and hanged by the neck until you are dead. When Michael Reeves was signed to do Witchfinder General, he wanted Donald Pleasance to play the part of Matthew Hopkins. And when he found out that American International was going to be distributing the film in the United States and thus had a controlling interest in, in the production, they wanted Vincent Price to play the part. Reeves went through the roof. He did not want Vincent Price to play this part, and he let everybody know it, including Vincent Price. Price showed up on the set for the first day, and Reeves wouldn't even talk to him. He would stay away from him. He'd turn his back on him. It was immediate hostility, uh, just more than I think Price ever had seen in his life. I think Price was quite capable of walking through a picture. The thing is, Price walking through a picture was more entertaining than many another performer at full bore. But I think he, he, he saved his shot. I think sometimes he could be wrong. I think he initially intended on walking through Witchfinder General and got a shock uh, when he saw exactly how on game everybody else was. Because if you look at it now, of course, Witchfinder General is a, is a cult movie and Michael Reeves is revered. Then he was some kid. Um, and there's nobody else in it that Price would have heard of. Yeah, actually, if you look, look at it, there's, it's a very distinguished cast. You know, you know Olga V, Nicky Henson, Hilary Dwyer, all these, and, and lots of good, solid British character actors. But nobody who would have crossed Price's radar. So Price must have seen a call sheet with, you know, genius director, brackets 22, and load of names you've never heard of, and thought it's going to be like one of those AIP beach party pictures. Price went in probably thinking that he knew how to play this part. And he would start his performance, he'd start to do a scene, and Reeves would jump right in and he'd say, don't do that. And Price would say, what? And he said, you're doing that. And I don't know what I'm doing. And they'd start it again. He said, there, there, you're doing it again. And it, the, it got on Vincent Price's nerves so much and he was so on edge that the performance he eventually gave is like a tightly coiled spring. He's, it's like he's never been in any other movie. And after the fact, after this horrible experience, he did concede that Reeves had done him a favor by uh, making him think about what he was doing and by putting him on edge so that he gave this incredibly evil, uh, unaffected 
performance. I trust you know the old man. Better than anyone. And in private talk, you may shed some light on his innocence. Private? Yes, away from the distraction of the crowds. Perhaps in the quiet of your room tonight, you might be able to help me prove him guiltless. Although Vincent Price was not the, f the director's first choice to be Matthew Hopkins, he brings a gravitas to the role that pretty much no other actor could have done at the time. In the course of it, maybe Michael really would have inspired him to, to a good performance because he would realise it was a terrific role for him. Um, I'm not sure what screen time he gets in the overall picture, but he obviously dominates the whole film. Um, and there's no way any other actor really could have could have done that because, and also of course, he's able not to be too camp, although he'd like to do the kind of comedy. There's something really dark and strange about that character, which is never really explained. Um, and I think he would have had to bring a lot to it as an actor, you know, from the point of view of his craft and an understanding of, of characters, you know, from the inside, as it were. Because the less you give a character motivation, obvious motivation, the more they've got to find it for themselves. So I would think even if it was a stormy relationship, I'm sure at the end of it, they both were very pleased by the, by the relationship. Although apparently, according to stories, Price and Reeves did not get on during the shooting of the film, there is a sense that by the end of it there was a kind of grudging mutual respect between the two of them. And certainly Reeves makes Price step up his game in this film. Uh, for the first time in many years, you realise just by watching the film that Price is no longer coasting his way through the film. He is actually giving a very, very serious performance. Not only can I manage without him, but I intend to instigate a new method of execution. And you, Master Webb, you shall aid me in carrying it out. What's that, sir? You'll see. It's a fitting end for the foul ungodliness in womankind. Yes, sir. Now, fetch that young bear here. Well, during the making of Conqueror Worm or Witchfinder General, um, the catering truck didn't show up one day. And uh, there were all these actors out in the middle of nowhere who needed to eat. And uh, maybe it was because of the tension on the set, but Price decided he would take matters in his own hands. And he took off uh, with a couple other people. They went off to a neighboring village, brought back all this food, and he prepared... Uh, meals for the entire production crew and, and cast. Ian Ogilvy was to Michael Reeves in the way that you know, John Wayne was to John Ford, you know, uh, you know, um, or um, Jean-Pierre Léo to Francois Truffaut. You know, he, was, he was an actual alter ego. I mean, if you see photographs, they look alike, they dress alike, they were the same age, obviously the same background from the same school or whatever. Um, yeah, and, and actually, uh, Ian Ogilvy in those two films for Reeves um, is, is working pretty near the top of his game. Have you been through Branderston at all, man? Branderston? Aye, and a fine commotion they're staring up there. What, are you taking their horses? No, nothing like that. A mass sang in. Who? Witches, I heard. Two women and a priest. Where was the priest from, man? Branderston, I suppose. A brave old boy for all his white hairs. Was he a friend of yours? Two troopers, Gifford and Harcourt, will be here directly. Have them take these horses here back to the regiment and report that I'm delayed. I'll join them further north. Do you understand? Yes, but where will you be going to? Hey, the house! Ah! Witchfinder General was retitled by American International Pictures as The Conqueror Worm to tie in with their Edgar Allan Poe series of Vincent Price movies. Um, it is generally perceived, I think, now that that was a bit of a mistake. Although, interestingly, Vincent Price recorded an extra um, dialogue for that movie, so he has a voiceover reading a, an excerpt from the, uh, from the Poe story at the beginning of, of, of the American version. It makes no sense in the context of the film. But this was their way of dragging it back into the American international mold. And uh, Price said he didn't even know about it until he was flying back from somewhere and read that he was starring in The Conqueror Worm. And he, he had no idea what this film was because he'd never made anything with that title. But uh, the film was released here and it was uh, very well received. Uh, it was... Um, it was banned by several places because of the violence. Uh, it was uh, some of the critics didn't care for the level of violence. Again, this was the time when films like The Wild Bunch were coming out, when violence was sort of making its uh, move on on mainstream movies. So this really uh, was a time for people to to question what movies could do, 
and the conqueror worm was another step in that progression. <laughs> For a while there in the 1980s, the music went out of copyright, and so another version of the film turned up on on television broadcast with with some other odd uh, synch synchronized music in there. Uh, and so they hired a man named Kendall Schmidt and his synthesizer to come in and do burbly 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 synthesizer scores, replacing uh, most criminally the uh, uh, astonishingly beautiful score. People who had seen the film years before bought this video they were in an uproar because the the grandeur of this beautiful music was gone and we were stuck with somebody said sounded like somebody sitting off the set with a moog synthesizer making it up as they went along and the film really uh suffered from it and it's been unavailable for quite some time what's interesting too about the score is that uh, paul ferris who did did the score also has a small role in the film. He played the uh, husband of uh, a young woman who was burned uh, for witchcraft. And uh, instead of using his real name, he used the name Maurice Jarre, which is sort of a play on words for Maurice Jarre, who was this great writer of, of many film soundtracks. And uh, it must have really disappointed him uh, to see this film come out, in which he even appears and they've taken his score off of it. God be with you, Richard. Goodbye, Richard. Goodbye, Sarah. I'll see you again soon. I think the major problem with Fighter General is Hilary Dwyer, who seems to have been under contract with AIP Antigon at this time, who is not the most dynamic leading lady in, in any film. Whereas Ian Ogilvy, who as we talked about, worked with uh, his friend Michael Reeves before, actually does give a pretty good performance in the film, although he's still a pretty young actor at this time. Uh, I think one of the, the great things about the film is the ending. It, it, it almost ushers in this early 1970s theme in British horror films, where they have these dystopian endings, where they end on a downer and, and evil wins. And we certainly see that in Witchfinder General, and I can remember at the time when I saw it, it came as quite a shock that the, the, the good guys actually don't come out of it unscathed at the end. And I understand that this was actually something that was improvised on the set. In the original script, there is a happy ending. But uh, in the actual, when they were filming the film, they decided to improvise this ending where basically Sarah's character goes insane. And it really does work. It, it leaves you coming out of the movie theater going, oh my God, what have I just been put through? I've been put through a ringer. <laughs> One of the great things about Witchfinder General is it's one of the very few British films that does for our history and our countryside what the best American Westerns do for their history and their countryside. I think that, you know, it, it's still considering that this tiny island has this amazing sweep of history and this vast diversity of landscape. It's still underfilmed. Yeah, you, know, you still basically see red buses and Tower Bridge in in uh, almost all British movies, or uh, or the same. Yeah, you know, uh, few urban areas. You very rarely see films about the British countryside. Uh, in that, I think Michael Reeves probably is the the heir to say Michael Powell. We look back on it now and we think of it as this, this cult classic, this, this pinnacle of British movie making in the 1960s. But at the time, it was just another film. I don't remember the reviewers singling out for any particular special praise. Uh, Michael Reeves was pretty much an unknown character at that time. I believe he only ever did one real print interview. Um, and so there was no real sense of the auteur theory there. It was just another horror film. And I think it's only in retrospect that we've come to realize just how good a film it is. You enjoy torture, don't you, Stan? And you? Sir? 